Hey guys, welcome to a new episode of the Late Night Lake Show podcast. It is your host, Ricky and Kwame, and making his season five debut, stepping into the Late Night Lake Show podcast. Our, our, our home. Haven't I already our, been our on? Our boy. Wait, you have? Yeah. I'm pretty sure he has, yeah. Oh, that's on Frank Vogel, Vogel for like an hour. Okay, yeah. we, we talk on a lot of shows, so I forget if you've been on or not. Well, making a return to his season five debut, Alan Ramrick of what Lakers side chats blipped in, you know, just a part of the 19 media group family. Alan, how you doing today, brother? I'm good. You know, I'd be better if Ricky doesn't butcher my name. But yeah, Ramrick. 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 I always Ramich. add an r in there i'm gonna redo this and you never say about that no no no. we like the intro it, it, it's fresh it's cool we all like right. it all right fuck it we, we we keep on going uh this is probably going to be the peak highlight of the energy for the podcast so far um the los angeles lakers have waited looked observed the nba trade deadline has come and gone and the lakers stood pat they did absolutely nothing sitting four games under 500 at 36 and 40. Um, if a lot of people that didn't know this, Dave McMenamin sent out a nice little tweet reminding everyone that when the Cleveland Cavaliers were in the same position, LeBron and the Cavs flipped upside down half their roster and reloaded and they made a championship run. Um, the Lakers did the opposite of that, which was nothing. And um, now we sit here trying to make sense of it all. So I got my boy Alan in here. Obviously, Kwame is in the building. If you guys hadn't, uh, if you guys missed our live uh, late night Lake Show spaces, that that was that was an experience. I hope everybody is um, recovering from that. Drinking plenty of fluids, water, uh, you know, uh, liquid IV is really good these years. So just try to put it all together. So, um, but yeah, the, the, let's just get into it, Alan. Um, in the Lakers doing absolutely nothing um, for this trade deadline and now have shifted their eyes to the buyout market and the ghost of Kendrick Nunn returning in late March. Um, just talk to me about how the past 72 hours unfolded based off of information that you were provided. So as far as I'm aware, the Lakers were trying hard. Um, to move not just Taylor and Horton Tucker, but Russell Westbrook also. They were very reticent to move the 2027 first because they did not want to unload the entire proverbial clip. Um, and yeah, not many teams were biting. The The closest they came was that free team trade that Michael Scotto um, reported on. Shout out to Michael of Hoops Hype and Yossi Mike of was Hoops in the Hype. Late Night Lake Show spaces. Shout out, Mike. And for, for those of you who are listening, this is a part two to our discussion of the trade deadline. Part one was a lot more cheerier and happy, guys, because guess what? We weren't talking about the Lakers. Um, it didn't seem like the Lakers were going to get anything done pretty much this morning is the feeling that I got. I texted you guys that as, actually, and then there's some rumors going around that maybe something was about to happen, but it never felt likely. And, you know, I can't remember the last time. You know, when we were shit, it's fine. We're shit. You expect it, right? You know, you expect your team not to make too many moves. Like, you know, if you trade a veteran for a first-round pick, yeah, cool. That's what rebuilding teams do anyway, right? With this, though, nah, man. You, you got AD in his prime and LeBron James, and this is what we do. It makes no sense. The franchise needs burning down, man. Like, mm. straight up. There we rebuild. Go. Like, not rebuild, like, from the player standpoint, because you have two franchise cornerstones, but, you know, new owners, new front office, new coaching staff. Apart from Phil Handy, he can stay. He is the best player development guy in the NBA. So, he, of course, he can stay. But everything else, bye. See you later. So really, it seemed like the Lakers were trying to improve the roster, but literally couldn't because of decisions that had already been made in the acquisitions of Russell Westbrook, the, you know, up and down year so far of Talon Horton Tucker, the non-existence of Kendrick Nunn. The the pieces just weren't there to put together the the one first round draft pick in 2027 the pieces just weren't there to put together what seemed like for some teams enough for them to quote unquote 
help the Lakers out. And the Lakers just didn't have enough to, to put them over the top with some of these trades. I mean, uh, Kwame, I, I think we just need to get into the biggest one uh, that we just need to address right off the bat. And it's the Houston trade. And you wow. brought this to my attention, and I think you're still probably steaming from it. So why don't you – It's true, by the way. I, 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 you I can verify it. it. I, can, I can verify that that was on the table. So just, just walk us through what it seemed like the Lakers walked away from as far as a deal that could have sent Russ to the Houston Rockets. So it sounds like they had a trade on the table that was for Russell Westbrook, Taylor Horton Tucker in the 2027 first. In return, you get John Wall, Christian Wood. And I'm not sure if there were um, auxiliary picks, seconds, or whatever. I doubt there was any first attached to that. Maybe a second or two attached to that. And it seems as if the Lakers had taken it down. Yeah, they they were not about it. So what's curious to me is that I probably make that trade. I get you probably don't want to mortgage your last player in tail your last young player in that actually plays. I mean, there's Kendrick Dunn, but who the hell's Kendrick Dunn? And, you know, we obviously have him with um, Taylor Horton Tucker. So trading Taylor Horton Tucker and then the first round pick. The first round pick is something I would have just shipped. I mean, whatever. Who cares? The, it's a 13-year-old. It is what it is. We're in a win-now window. So if we mortgage our future, there's always ways to get draft picks later. In my opinion, I think there's always ways. Um, I do that trade. I know a lot of people don't aren't feeling John Wall. They're like, John Wall, what has he done? Honestly, this point of what I've seen with Russell Westbrook, in my humble opinion, I don't think John Wall could be any worse. <laughs> in my <laughs> humble opinion, I don't think he could be any worse. At worst, he does exactly what Russell Westbrook is doing. At worst, but there's a slight chance he could be better. You said Actually, there's, yeah. there's a chance. There's a, there's chance. a chance. And if there's a chance, I probably do it. So, and then you know, Christian Wood. I, I would Who's not a bad player. Are you kidding me? I would salivate at a Christian Wood, Anthony Davis, LeBron James front court. I would love that. Christian Wood has kind of had a down season, but he's playing for a team that's literally in the tank with Kevin Porter Jr. and, and Jalen Green, who see nothing the but the basket. And, you know, they're not they're not out there to make Christian Wood's life any better. What the hell? They're there to get their games off, being two young players at developing backcourt that a lot of people think could be a really good backcourt in, you know, three, four years. They probably can be. But Christian Wood's kind of the odd man out there. He didn't join that team in the way the team is now. He wanted to play with Harden and Steven Silas, and, you know, he's just he, – he, he, he's left with a bunch of kids in a rebuild mode. So, hey, maybe a new scenery, new team would have reinvigorated him, and he would have been the player that got him that contract originally. That's kind of what I think. So, in my opinion, i probably do it. I, I understand why there would have been hesitancy, but I hope the hesitancy was over THT and not that damn pick. If the hesitancy evolved THT, cool, sure, I guess. But if it's that pick, they're tripping. Send that shit to hell. I'm scared to ask. I'm scared to ask. Alan, where, where, what was it? Uh, they were scared to do both. Yeah, it's it's a case of they think that Wall could be worse and Wall's not enough of an upgrade long-term to give up both Taylor and the first-round pick. I think if it was, if it was either or, I don't I think if it's without the first round pick, I think they definitely do it. Without the first, the first, I'm sending the first. Who cares? No, no, no. But what I'm saying is, it leaves assets on the table still that are enticing enough for other teams. Or they'll be yeah, like, that yeah, first is more we'll do a trade. Than THT right now. I mean, yeah. maybe, but I no, mean, no, I think, it is. No, no as far as like maybe. trading, it's like in the market because people people yeah. are predicting that the Lakers will be a dumpster fire in five years, so they're trying to get it on the cheap now so they can potentially have what they assume would be a top five pick if the Lakers pan out how most of these front officers think it, they'll pan out. I'm surprised that it wasn't more heavily coveted because it didn't feel like it was. It well, didn't feel like that's what people are trying to rock the Lakers, bro. That's what I'm saying. And you Fair. Know, but that's the it's Lakers tax. That's what you got to do when it comes to the Lakers, but I, I, I I do that trade. I mean, what boat? What are you looking for? I mean, I understand you don't want to mortgage all your assets, but are these assets really going to come around and save you later? I don't know if that's the case. You you have arguably one of the greatest players to ever touch the basketball court, still playing at an incredibly high level. You have Anthony Davis in his prime. Who's to guarantee by the time that twenty twenty seven pick comes around that you have a team that's even remotely good? Well, hey. well that's sort of the point though as well. 
if they're not remotely good, at least they'll have that first round pick to rebuild. But the Lakers aren't usually in the business of rebuilding. That's not really yeah, but this franchise's it's thing. Worth more, it's worth more. It's worth more the worse they get, right? So yeah. I don't think the Lakers can control sometimes how bad they get. I think they can control how, I mean, that, you know, is a pendulum, whatever, but. No, I'm not trying to hear that. For me, now's the time we want to be, we want to be smart with our assets. Man, fuck that. We should have done that two, three seasons ago. To pick now to be, we already sold the ship. You might as well just keep selling it. Nah, as I long mean, as you have these guys, I think you just keep selling it. To hold on to this business, it just it doesn't make sense. So we're basically blowing up another year. LeBron's only going to be another year older. We're basically going to burn a tenure of having one of the greatest players of all time to play for this franchise because we decided at the end to be cheap with the assets. Man, I, I can't I can't vibe with that. That just feels weird to me. I get if we're thinking super long term, sure. But our, super long term, do we need this front office? Do we need any of this? Bit? There's a lot more problems than worrying about a pick, in my opinion. But can, again, can, maybe I'm just can, speaking emotionally because I'm mad that we're gonna have to wallow in in dust for three more months. So can we just can we just address the elephant in the room as well? Ninety percent of this season is clutch and LeBron's doing. No, we sure. Don't. Like coffee's and, sure. No, no, no. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. Because it's it's well documented now, Quam Dog, that this was LeBron and A D w- wanting Russell's Brussels. Now, everything that came after that, you, I think was minimum contracts in the MLE. But I, you know, I, I think LeBron's got to step up to the to the pulpit and at least confess the sin that, you know. Hey man. I get it. LeBron did ask for that. It is what it is. But at the at the end of the day, this is my thing. And again, maybe this is the this is the LeBron standing me jumping out to defend the guy. <laughs> the GM should have said no. We watched in Cleveland, Colby Altman, brand new GM, stepped in the building in the Cleveland Cavaliers situation. Kyrie asked, I want to be traded. LeBron said, do not trade him. When we get to training camp, I'll mend this. Kobe said, man, forget you. I'm sending him. They sent him. What happened? <laughs> they still yeah. made the finals. Granted, they did have to do another they to, roster flip. They had to flip it I over get again. It. But th- that was a rookie GM telling <laughs> the greatest player of that franchise's history by a wide, wide margin, I'm going to take a pass on your advi- ad vision, and I'm going to take this player and send him. It is what it is. Not I think mention, Rob uh, probably should have had the foresight to do that as well. If it was really that bad of asset juggling, should have been like, look, guys, I know this is what you want, but um, I'm the GM here. So I don't know. Hey, call clutch what it is, whatever it may be. I've seen it be defied before for the betterment of the situation. Again, maybe the Cavs do different. Had Kyrie stays, who knows? But I, I find it hard to sit here and say LeBron's the real GM here. I, I get his influence is very heavy. But every star player, I'm sure, has an influence with their team. You're not going to say it. But yeah, you're, you're not going to say it. Say what? Well, I, I, what you want that. me to say? I've Listen. heard the man say, I've heard him be told no. So I get it. No, no. But, but, you've, been, but, but you, you've heard him say no when Col- when Dan Gilbert was on Colby Altman's side. Jeannie Buss was very firmly in the trade for Russell Westbrook camp. Man, then, then we can't sit here and just blame Broad. Jeannie's, no, no, no. Jeannie's like, no, no, that's why I said the 90%. Lakers fans are going to go cuckoo for Russell Westbrook. I never even heard of the hell. That's for Jeannie. Don't worry. All right, go, go ahead and say what you need to say. Like I said, I think LeBron's an asshat for bringing that bastard here, too. They're crying. I think Real he's quick. an asshat. It's Real not, quick, it wasn't Lakers a good move. Fans. Lakers fans, let us know what you think. We're going to clip this segment out. Let us know. If you had to split up the blame pie as to why the Lakers are currently at where they're at right now, where where would you split it up between the, the front office, LeBron James, Clutch Sports, and Russell's Brussels, and Frank Vogel? I think it's a 33-33-33 split. I really do believe that. I was being facetious when I said 90. So I think it's front office, ownership, and, you know, Clutch. I think it's it's on all of them. Like I legitimately believe that Clutch, as great as they have been in bringing LeBron and AD to LA, and respect to them for that, they should you know not meddle in decisions this much. Mm. In my opinion, I don't think any agency should. 
But I'm not saying that because I hate, you know, players having this empowerment. Me and Kwame have had this discussion a lot of times. I think player empowerment is a great thing, right? But also you need to let an NBA team be an NBA team. You know, it's, it's all good and well having 15 clutch clients, but if these 15 clutch clients don't work into a great team, what the hell's the point, right? You know, so I think the front office for not being strong enough, you know, I think that's a big issue. And, you know, when, when you're a head director of basketball affairs, you know, left Twitter because he was liking tweets that involved a pornographic nature, that's an issue. Mm, good times, Morongo. <laughs> Like, and then Jeannie Buss, A, is, doesn't want to spend money. B, only hires people that she likes and knows, which is a huge, huge issue, which is why we're in this bullshit mess, right? And no one wants to call Jeannie out because she's a lovely person. And by all accounts, she is a lovely person. However, without LeBron James making the decision to come to LA, and he would have come to LA regardless of who was owning the Lakers, who was in charge of the Lakers, I firmly believe that. Except what do we remember, Jeannie? Like, Je- you the fuck with them. Yeah, but, you know, I'm, I, I legitimately believe if, let's say, Steve Ballmer owned the Lakers, he would have oh, came yeah, to the Lakers. There. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, sure. you know, so, but if we take out the LeBron section, what is Jeannie Buss's tenure as owner remembered by? The worst era of Laker basketball, we not just we have ever seen, that's ever happened. Can I ask you a comp real quick, Alan? And the, uh, excuse me, because I have a couple of questions in trying to make this point. But um, who owns, uh, what's the family that owns the Seahawks right now? The Allen family. Right. And it's the the sister or the wife who, who's Jody. in control. Yes. Jody. The brother or the husband passed who was the controlling owner. Yeah. So right? Jody's brother, Paul Allen, passed. So Paul Allen, and you know, from what I hear in my football podcast, was a active owner, hands oh, on owner, and him and Pete Carroll kind of worked together. But very much, he was still that top of the totem pole, and everything fell under him when he passed. That kind of signaled when the Seahawks kind of moved into a. This is a Pete Carroll. Um, you know, all in Garkey right now, like he a dictatorship to himself. It's because the uh, the sister is a hands off owner. Now, this has nothing to do with, with with gender, right? It's about how engaged you are as an owner. Jeannie Buss is there every day, that talking and Lakers, doing engaged. all of that, super engaged, right? But the, there is a clear drop off slash difference from obviously her father and how he ran the team and who Jeannie has entrusted. Hell, Jeannie's already said, like, it was her father's dream for her and Magic to run the Lakers. Okay, how'd that turn out? It was a shit show, right? So, I mean, obviously, to the point of when when regimes flip over, turn just because it stays in the family and it has that last name, that does not mean that the same level of competency is going to carry over. And I think the, Look just at the from Yankees. the people, you know, right. You know, just from the people that Jeannie has entrusted, they're, they're leading us right back off a cliff that LeBron just fucking glided in and saved us on. Yes, there is a couple holes in the shoot that might be a little self-inflicted, but at the end of the day, you know, the Lakers will continue to attract stars, but it's like, God damn, how ugly does it have to get before you bounce back up? And someone's like, yeah, I'll take the, I'll take the task of leading this franchise. Yeah. Like, I think you summed it up perfectly there. And nepotism. So like, no nepotism. So, so like when we talk about nepotism, who would be one guy, a former Laker who you'd have in the franchise as a consultant, 10 times out of 10. Hmm, who's helped looking across the hall? I don't want who's helped Golden it. State build a dynasty? Who's helped the Clippers be a really competent organization? Help but you let your here. personal you let Crap. your personal feelings get in the way. You know, he Jerry West wanted bygones to be bygones. And I'm not saying that Jerry West was right in that situation. I think there's a lot of blame that should be attributed to Jerry West for what happened between him and Jeannie. Because I don't think it's his place to say who he she should and should not date. You know, so I just want to get that out there, first of all, right? But we all know in business you sometimes have to let your personal feelings 
put to the side, right? You need to put it to the side for the betterment of your franchise. And are you telling me that if Jerry West was the most influential person in basketball instead of, I don't know, Kurt Rambis? Yeah. Are you telling Good me that the Lakers Kurt. wouldn't be in a better position? Of course they would. I mean, uh, absolutely they would. You know. And now I think... I think Rob Palinka's made mistakes, but is he the worst GM in the league? I don't think so. And we, we it wasn't very long ago that we were all saying how great Rob Palinka was. Rob's how biggest much is he issue. Hamstrung? That's exactly it. Rob's biggest issue is he already told you who he is. He is a player first, player centric GM. He says he is here to collaborate and work with LeBron and work with AD. You remember when AD was on uh, doing one of those backstage Lakers interviews a couple years back and he was like, yeah, man, like Rob kept blowing up my phone, blowing up my phone. And I'm like, you know, trying to watch a movie or something. And he's like, that's how active he is. He's always consulting us. Like that's his MO and that's his MO from his agent days, right? Quite, We're seeing how that him. cannot always be the greatest avenue when trying to run a franchise because you know, players are players, right? They have friends. They they think one way, but it's your job to think in addition to that. So um, I want to bring up a quick quote from, from Mr. Palinka here um, after the break. <laughs> we were aggressive in a lot of conversations trying to improve the team. We always want to put this team in the best position to win a championship. But ultimately... We didn't find a deal that had a net positive effect for the short-term success of the team and the long-term. And those are both things we consider. Lakers, VP of Basketball Operations, Rob Palenka. Um, Kwame, you heard it in the spaces today. Someone asked, um, you know, uh, why I don't we don't talk about Lord Palenka's secret society anymore. And if you were actually paying attention we haven't brought up that, you know, that slogan uh, for close to a season and a half now. We This is everything's fluid in the late night Lake Show world. The only thing that is consistent is this Lakers propaganda. But um, Mr. Rob has stepped up to the podium today after a, a null trade deadline and pretty much started, you know, at least he didn't do any Bible quotes in this one. Uh, pretty much said a whole bunch of nothing that we predicted in the in the spaces previously. So um, where does this response, this statement from Palinka, pretty much representing the front office's decision to like saying, hey, at the end of the day, it wasn't going to help us in the short and long term, a.k.a. it seems like they would have had to hurt themselves with that first round pick or THT, right? Um, in order to get marginally better now. Are you buying that? Does it matter? W what do you think? Was Rob, did Rob have moves to make and just chose not to? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I clearly am on the opposite side as you guys. I don't think that pick is, this should have been the point of contention in a lot of situations. That's just me. I think you use the window and take what you can get in the window. Um, but I mean, at the same time, is there a one person fix all out there that would have saved our season? Probably not. Um, I think you would have had to do a lot of work. It would have had to basically be a roster overhaul, but we just don't have enough. I mean, for me, I'm just shocked that we didn't, you know, Rob didn't do the classic purchase a second round pick or we didn't offload anybody. You're talking about looking at the buyout. We didn't flip any of our end of the bench guys for at least like a second or cash considerations or anything. We did nothing. That's what's a little more crazy to me is that to, to flip that statement and to do not even sell some of your lesser players that, you know, may be able to help a different team. Maybe, I mean, DeAndre Jordan's probably not helping anybody, but maybe Kent Bazemore helps a team or something. And you just take, you know, a, a 20, 59 second. I know you can't trade that far, but whatever, just something. I'm just a little surprised that none of that happened. So, um, but outside of that, it seems as if he's just kind of saying, Hey man, y'all go, the players go ahead to figure this one out. Like y'all go ahead to figure it out. Y'all owe. I can't save y'all this time. So that's kind of the vibe I got. Still talk about Kendrick Nunn's return in late March, like brother. Yeah, possibly <laughs> like, late March. Possibly late like, March, bro. bro. Like the season will much, end three weeks later. How much time? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. How much time He's is left done. for this man to play? At this point, I think the Kendrick Nunn experiment is, 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 is it's it's chalk. It doesn't get us anything. So, um, 
to say there were moves to be made, that's probably not true. There probably were moves, but it were moves that wouldn't have done much. I think we've kind of made our bed and got to lay in it, or we had to wake ourselves up. And I think Rob's just kind of like, yeah, you guys got to figure this one out. So I guess I'm not mad at the quote. I think it's the reality we all secretly knew deep in the back of our minds that we knew this was going to be our scenario, but we'd hoped and prayed and, you know, really wanted it to be anything but but I think we're stuck in what we all truly knew deep down inside. So I get it, Rob. I mean, it is what it is, but, you know, we're not singing your praises anymore. That's not necessarily completely your fault, but, you know, you should have toughened up when they said, let's bring in the guy that we didn't guard in the bubble. And, Did not you know, guard in the bubble. I mean, he started I'm yelling sorry. into the stands looking for Ray, Ray John's brother. I mean, Good times, man. No, that's real quick, I'm Alan. I got uh, I got one more quote from uh, Mr. Palinka for you, which I think pretty much uh, summarizes what Kwame summarized pretty well. He said it's important to remember that the metric of success here is you win a championship or you don't. There's no middle ground. We have to be on a pathway to put this team in a position to try and compete and for and win a championship. He later went on to say, when it comes to finding success. When a team is not winning, I think the most important action is for everybody to look in the mirror and be better. That includes the front office. It includes the coaches and it includes the players. So I say to you, Mr. Allen, if the Lakers are going to have any type of success or at least entertainment for the rest of the season and whatever version of the playoffs we see, um, what do you think needs the biggest adjustment? Is it the coaching or is it the players looking in the mirror and playing better? Like what, where does that land for you, brother? The short answer is yes. All of the above. Um, The long answer is, I don't know if it does get better. Like I'm trying to find an avenue in my head of whether it gets better for the Lakers. I cannot find it right now. Um, maybe you get a different Taylor Horton Tucker and he helps a lot. Uh, maybe you get an engaged LeBron James for the rest of the season, which I highly doubt. Maybe you get Anthony Davis continuing this in 29 and 11 run he's been on since he's been back. And that is possible because AD looks magnificent. But I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to find positives. Malik Monk's great. Love Malik. Hope he sticks around long term. Austin Reeves is great. Really like him. Really glad we found Stan. Really nice player. It sucks. Because, I don't know. Like, I have people calling me out on Twitter right now. I'm saying I'm I'm a fake fan. I'm only in it for the glory. And you guys know how much I love the Lakers. Wait, you're getting called out, Ellie. Yeah. One of my tweets went viral when I said that the Lakers need a new front office coaching staff and ownership group. Um, But, yeah, you guys know me and how much I care about the Lakers. I stay up till 6 a.m. watching Laker games. No one can doubt how much I care about the Lakers. It physically pains me to the point that I've stopped talking about the Lakers in my podcast because it hurts me that much. Like... This season's just broken me. And to be honest with you, I think it's broken a lot of us, right? I think you guys are in the same boat. You guys are still doing a phenomenal job, you know, with your podcast and whatnot. I really want to commend you on that. Um, But I feel like we're all in the same boat, right? I think we're all broken. And we have LeBron James and Anthony Davis on the team. That's why it hurts differently. If we were shit and we were a rebuilding young team, I don't think we'd care as much. We'd be like, let's watch the young guys play basketball. Let's see how much they improve. Who cares if we only win 25, 30 games? It's part of the rebuild, right? It's the fact that it's not supposed to be this way. And we'll get people saying, oh, yeah, we're spoiled. Yeah, we are spoiled. We're Laker fans. We're not Milwaukee fans. No disrespect to Milwaukee. We're not Milwaukee fans. We're not Orlando fans. We're not Mavs fans who've seen one championship in 50 years incredibly happy with it we're not portland fans it's different and we have high expectations for the lakers right not just me so you know that's where i am right now kwame what uh what would 
I know I'll be watching the rest of the season in a straight jacket because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, Alan, you, you, had, you said broken was the word. I guess you guys, as you know, host of the Blipped In podcast, I know this is DC and not Marvel, but would you guys say the Joker is broken? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where I'm at right now. I, you know, I am definitely have been tortured enough through this season where I am here for the rest of the bullshit now. So, uh, Kwame, how are you going to look at the rest of um, the Lakers season after, you know, now turning their attention to the buyout market and we'll do a round robin of where we do, who we expect the Lakers to pick up because they are going to pick up somebody because there's no way they do absolutely nothing. Um, that's what we said three weeks ago. Yeah, don't, don't, hey, we got to clear up a roster spot. So that's very likely that we do nothing. (laughs) It's it's possible. Through what lens are you watching the rest of this season on? Because I'm, I'm kind of putting the championship, uh, talks, shit talking on the back burner for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I, I, it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough to watch this team and just, you know, understand that this is what we're stuck with. Um, I think the most difficult thing for me is to why I'm as upset about this trade deadline as I am is that I don't know how the players are supposed to fix this when the issue has gone from the, from moving from just being on the court into player and coaching staff relations. If all the Russ rumors would not want to work out with Phil Handy, we've heard the post game interview insane, comments. By the way. Yeah, but we've heard the post game interview comments about Frank Vogel and how he's earned the right to be in closing lineups. That feels like a lot of tension that now you have to try and play through, and I don't know how you solve that. I like I feel like that's always going to be the elephant in the the room that's just hanging over this team, no matter how good they can appear to look for the rest of the season. When you when you start having player coach relationships that are strained, we see how it affects both sides. I mean, Doc Rivers told this man Ben Simmons, you know, I don't know if you could be a, a starting point guard on a championship caliber team, and my man said I'm not playing for you again, and literally did not suit up for like nine months. So now we got to have a similar situation. Obviously, it's not as bad because it's not like a season ending comment, but. Obviously, there's tension built up there, and that's where I find it a little harder to be like, ah, you know, yeah, let's just let the guys play through it, you know. So, in my opinion, that's where I think Rob should have looked a little harder to remedy this because it's not just strictly play on the court. And obviously, the play on the court is the reason why Frank feels that way. But there's a lot of factors here that just need require to shake up. And we've decided to not do anything. And again, I don't think there's necessarily a fix all, but now we just have a complete dysfunction that we got to ride through the rest of the year. Sure. We, even if we did shake the table and it's not necessarily puts together a championship team, like Robin said, it's either you win a championship or you don't, the middle ground is nothing. You know, there's nothing in between that. I get that, but how are you supposed to try and fix relationships? Are we just going to wait to fire Frank at the end of the season? Why didn't we do it several weeks ago? It feels yeah, weird. Man. It feels like we just we're doing every move too late oh, at yeah. this juncture. And it doesn't feel great as a fan watching it, but maybe there's things beyond the scope of our knowledge that we can see. But I just it doesn't feel well with feel right with me. So I'm just going to watch the team and, you know, I'll root for them and do what I can and, you know, keep hashtagging chasing Kareem and. You know, I guess that's what LeBron's going to have to do this season. But, you know, it's a disappointment all around. And as, you know, the resident LeBron stand, it's disappointing to see, you know, him fumble this team in ways that necessarily haven't. And again, maybe he got a little he got a little big for his britches in Cleveland where he was kind of able to influence the front office. And I'm not sure if he was actually handpicking outside of Kevin Love some of the other trades, I feel like. But he did put pressure that the front office needs to make adjustments. I feel like he got a little cocky with that came to LA was like I want this this and that and pushed it a little his his influence a little too far and now we're stuck with this so disappointed there disappointed in Anthony Davis co-signing that because there's no way Anthony Davis was like heck no he probably was like yeah sure give me him I see what he did with Steven Adams you know I'm 300 times better than Steven Adams so I'll look crazy out here so I'm sure there was a lot of factors but and then Russ he's got to look himself in the mirror because he has been mud <laughs> mud like bro we you gotta get something. into that root like, cause that we are here gotta change so we are here for two distinct reasons yep right russell westbrook and frank vogel 
yeah. are are diabolical enemies right now. Yeah, arch nemesis. This arch point. nemesis, bro. Like it's like Rick Carlisle is... and Rashawn Rondo. And shit, yeah. it's like Rick Carlisle and Dennis Smith Jr. too. Like it's just not a good yeah. relationship right now. And if they're not talking, and clearly Russ is doing post game interviews saying he's done enough in his career to earn the right yeah, to play late that. in games now. And Frank Vogel's like, excuse me? Okay, bet. Well, now get ready for a whole bunch more of this shit when you play like ass. So, you know, that kind of is what my thoughts were waking up this morning. Like, clearly, some form of divorce needs to happen here. You're just going to keep the two pit bulls in the corner. And I'll say this. I will say this. Frank Vogel do his shit. Frank Vogel does what Frank Vogel wants to do. I remember back in his Indiana days where like after they made a strong playoff run and going into the next season, the teams were asked, uh, reporters were asking Frank Vogel about like the team success. He's like, yeah, you know, I think the players that they played fantastic last year. I also think that it was uh, fantastic coaching uh, on my part, if I say so myself. So Frank has never been lost for confidence in Frank Vogel. Like, so coming back to, la frank vogel i remember some backstage lakers stuff and they're talking about yes frank vogel does a lot of consulting but at the end of the day it's my decision in him saying that the man's not afraid to kind of put his foot down and do shit even if it's really dumb stuff like start the tank commander and play him how many minutes Alex? also 36 36 36. (laughs) also do we really believe knowing what we know about frank vogel people going oh it's not his offense Frank Bogle is not letting anyone else run this team or any facet of this coaching setup apart from Frank Vogel. Are we all in agreement on that? Yeah, we saw the yeah. bubble offense. That was just LeBron and AD doing the thing. Frank was not putting like, nothing together to help that. <laughs> people say, no, it's David Fisdale. No. If David Fisdale was in charge of the offense like everyone says he was, DeAndre Jordan wouldn't have started for 26 games. Still agree you know, just that he is employed by the Los Angeles that's what I'm Lakers. It, it's hard to really find any bit of confidence. Avery Bradley here. got cut by three teams. Free. We said, and he's getting and we 36 said minutes stardom. a game. We said stardom and that's, playing 36 minutes. That's that cold shower right there that you just laid down, Alan. It, he was twerking for Golden State to keep him. Yeah, like, and then apparently Steph Curry was pissed off. When they kept Gary Payton, Gary Payton the second for whatever reason, mm. I was calling him GP Junior. Um, when he was pissed off because he likes Avery Bradley, and I'm like, cool. Gary Payton's an infinitely better basketball player, though. I would swap and, him right now without thinking twice. And you know the thing that Frank Vogel thinks that Avery Bradley is defensively. That's what Gary Payton actually is defensively. And Steph Curry realized it about three games, and I went, "Oh." We made the right decision there, didn't we? Frank's mind is still stuck in his Indiana era of players. Yeah, like, yeah he's still 2014, coverage. man. He's still in 2014. <laughs> Ever since LeBron burned PG on that back cut and just sent them into hell, um, it, it really just seems like Frank values whoever was the best during that time. Um, and do you know what we don't talk about enough? Frank Vogel saying that the Minnesota championships do not count. Who the fuck are you to say that? No, I didn't know he said that. I didn't know he said that either, but that's wild. Who the fuck are you to say that? Music. All right, Frankie. Frank Tell us how you really man. feel. Um, it's, it, it's on Zach Close podcast. Shout out at BJ Meta. I will send you guys the link at once this podcast has finished. This is crazy. But, hey, I mean, I think that... I think Zach Lowe, so, sorry to interrupt. Zach Lowe actually checked him on it and went, that's not a right. That's not a smart thing you say in there. You know when Zach Lowe is defending the Lakers? That you messed up. I mean, but again, I think this just comes down to there's fault to blame everywhere from the players, mm-hmm. the coaching staff, front office, owner. Everybody's if blamed for the situation we're sitting in right now. And I just don't know how it gets much better. Is it, can we even do anything come off season time? I mean, I get Russ is on an expiring, um, which may make him a little more movable. But how movable is it? You know, we get access to the 2029 first round pick, but still, 
if we didn't want to trade 2027, do we really want to trade even further out 2029? Probably not. Um, do we lose Malik Monk for nothing? I pray not. But I mean, he's sitting on a veteran men balling. I'm sure he can get some cash Ola somewhere. <laughs> he, he's, you know, so I don't know. It's going to be tough to pick up the pieces and move forward here with a smile on our faces, even through next season. So um, I think we better just sit tight and enjoy the ride. And hey, maybe a miracle will happen and these guys figure it out, getting punched in the face of the trade deadline. Rob goes down there, puts baby powder on his hand, slaps the shit out of everyone down there. It's like, look, That'd figure nice. it out. And maybe they play like how they all should and we ball out and we win a championship. Hey, anything can happen, right? And, yeah, sure. Anything that can't happen. No, no, it, that is not possible. Well, he does need to go down there and slap shit out of a couple people, though. Yeah, <laughs> Russell Westbrook and but Frank Vogel being both of them. Then when he's done, he should go upstairs, slap shit out of Genie. <laughs> then probably shit. Look at the mirror and slap shit out of himself. Right. And then maybe we can get something going here. But it's it's not fun in Lakerland. I like I said. I mean, I get it. There there was no one one person fix it all here. We would have needed like an entire overhaul, but we're sitting on like nine minimums. Those are not good flippable pieces. We don't have cap space. You ain't got Pop no product. Time. We got how you, gonna, yeah. how you gonna move some dope if you ain't got no dope? You ain't got nothing to move, man. Yeah, so we're but um to figure it out. I was gonna ask about bio candidates. It don't fucking matter. Lakers fans, it, it, it don't matter. The, the, we're gonna the get Tristan people, Thompson and that's oh it. yes, Tristan Thompson will be able to keep up with all of his seeds that he has spread around California and be close to home. That that's honestly, that's where I'm at right now. Tristan Thompson becoming a Los Angeles Laker. And we just get TMZ reports of him doing dumb shit. And now all of a sudden now it's the TMZ Lakers. Like even if the Dennis Schroeder somehow comes back and decides, Oh sure. Let me try to make amends. I want to go into acting after my uh, basketball career and try to get some LA fans back on my side by saying, Hey, look, you know, I don't hate you guys. Why don't you, you know, I'm going to try to right our wrongs. We'll see. But at the end of the day, neither of those moves um, are going to push the Lakers further than what the team inside those walls right now um, need to address. The, the The Lakers' biggest issue are the Los Angeles fucking Lakers. And um, as Kanye said, you know, let's play the blame game because we got plenty to go around. And um, we're, we're going to we're just going to dive Head first. Hopefully, everybody's got their barf bags. We are getting ready to the second half of uh, this NBA season. The Los Angeles Lakers that you saw to start this season, those first 10 games that everyone said don't worry about, um, that's the team. But giddy up. So and we, and we um, didn't lose our coach. We kept and, it. And, too. and the coach stays, the point guard stays. Um, the only, the only thing that has, you know, uh, Kendrick Nunn has also stayed away. So that's been consistent. So, oh um, yeah, literally you know, nothing's I, changed. Yeah, literally no, nothing has changed. Out. Morale has not changed. Um, so yeah, the only, man, I guess we're not going to change either. Late night Lake show is taking off. We are doing our best to supply you guys with premium Laker propaganda. Um, thank you, Alan, so much for sliding on with us today, man. It's been a long day talking this depressing fucking franchise. So um, I'm going to try to recharge by drinking uh, Truly Mixed with Vodka. That seems like my cocktail of the evening. And um, try to trying to find some solace in all this. But um, why don't you let the people know where they can find you, my brother, and um, also let them know where they can find part one of this conversation where we talk about the NBA in general. So the part one of our conversation was a brilliant, brilliant chat with myself, Ricky, Quam, and also one of my other co-hosts, Mr. Yossi Goslin of Hoops Height. It was a great discussion. It was a lot more positive than this one, guys. So, you know, I'd highly yeah, recommend go check going that to out listen if you want to that smile. Because we, we had a good time on there before before we had this, you know, really depressing session. We also have blipped in. Um, I cannot lie, guys. I was going to release it today, but today just knocked the stuffing out of me. That's um, not. Yeah. Yeah. So let's give everyone a weekend laugh tomorrow. I'm on the blipped in episode. I, I it was phenomenal. I touched down. Have you re Have you reheard it? Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Honestly, I, I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. Wonderful. So, so, so we'll listen out tomorrow. You know, I'm going to drop it tomorrow for everyone's enjoyment. You know, we've had a rough time these past 72 hours. God knows we need a laugh. You will absolutely get a laugh with Ricky. On the late night from the late night late show on Blitzen, um, and yeah, this has been. I don't want to say it's been fun because it's been it's been fun talking to you guys, 
the topic's been horrendous. Um, I hope that next time I'm on, we don't have to talk so negatively, because this is twice in a row now, and it's killing my spirit. But I love you guys, so that makes me happier. Yeah, it's like you tell the Lakers to do something, they're going to be like, all right, hold hold my fucking beer. They're like a, a toddler right now. Um, Kwame, Brethren, folks know where to find you, but let them know if they forgot. Yeah, you can find me in my depressed Lakers fan <laughs> Twitter tweets on that Laquam James. Um, swing by. I mean, hey, if you want some fun after a, a terrible ass whooping that the Lakers seem to just get all the time, hey, jump into the late night Lake Show spaces, man. You'll get a lot of laughs. There's a lot of fun there. So, hey, even in the midst of a depressing season, the gang finds a way to make it fun. So, be sure to check those out. They're all over the place. Hey, we're on Bleacher Report. We're getting people in. Hey, the brand is growing. So make sure you check out the Late Night Lake Show spaces. Make sure you also check out all, all of 19 Media and all their great shows, the great content creators over there. So just want to make sure I shout those fellas out and Always. ladies too. There's everybody over there. So, hey, if you're looking for something, you'll find something there. But, yeah, like I said, hey, Late Night Lake Show's the brand. Follow us everywhere you can. We're growing. So don't miss the train. Choo-choo. Hey, real quick, to end the show. Because, Kwame, you brought up a great point. Where's, where's the camera? Right here. Um, going forward, for everyone, if you see that the brand has posted something and someone has aggregated it and has not given the brand credit and tagged Late Night Lakers, a Late Night Lake show, get on their head. I'm putting a reward out every time someone makes us aware of some bullshit of a major account, a major account now, not giving us our due credit and you calling them out, we're going to enter you into a uh, weekly raffle. That's where we at right now. We got some new merch coming, but if we're going to get Late Night Lake Show legitimate and the respect that it deserves, we're going to have to do it together. So it's it's going to be spot them, got them out in these streets, right? They not giving us our due. Let them know that we here and we see them not giving us our due because we got to shine together y'all y'all got to be looking up looking on tv like oh my god it's the late night lake show because you know y'all supported us so we want to make sure that we are gaining all of the due respect that y'all see that we deserve so we appreciate y'all rocking with us we gonna keep on we gonna keep this goliath running it's only gonna get better it's only gonna get stronger regardless of how the lakers want to handle their franchise this franchise is doing fine it's miami heat ran apparently god as much as we were talking about the effing miami heat on the nba chat. just on a side on a side note i am on loan for to the miami heat until the end of the season wow I, I, I am going to support the only lakers royalty that should be commended in the nba and that's patrick riley, patrick riley. Uh, yeah the godfather right. Allen has jumped ship ladies and gentlemen so we just go end it like there oh, man overboard for Kwame and Allen, it's Ricky. Late Night Lake Show. Peace.